name is Shannon. If you hear a chirp or two, this is Pearl. He's it's about his contractually stipulated nap time. So he'll be roosting on my knee. Thank you so much, all of you, for joining me today. I met some of you last, well, two weeks, two week, two weekends ago, I guess now, um, at the Houston Rice University pup walk, which was a lot of fun. Um, our dachshund Flash Gordon is a standard, very, very standard wire-haired purebred. And it was so wonderful to be in a group of people who recognized his breed. Because <laughs> normally what we hear is, oh, is that a schnauzer or a terrier mix? Or what mix is he? Okay, I see some nods. And so that was really fun. It was um it was good for him too, because he's never really learned how to play. And so it was really fun for him watching some of your dogs explore and especially that rock fountain that everyone got in. He was so unsure of that at first. And then when he saw the other dogs having fun, he was like, oh, maybe this isn't my bath time. Okay, cool. Maybe I could have fun with this. So, so anyway, um, my work um, after a decade-long career as a professional freelance writer, mostly in the pet industry, I tra have transitioned. I am now working as an animal communicator, an animal intuitive, and a Reiki master practitioner. I do uh, several different kinds of energy work, and I'm always learning new modalities. But my passion is to help connect pets and their people in relationships where conversations flow, flow more smoothly and more easily. And we're always, the human animal is always working at a disadvantage here because of course our, our dogs are tasked not only with trying to communicate, trying to learn our language, but also trying to find ways to communicate um, in, in ways that we, we can understand, that we can comprehend. And so it, these kinds of, of little impromptu workshops make it a lot easier because as we start to open up our intuitive pathways, we can start to at least meet our dogs halfway. And it can clear up some misunderstandings. It can also confirm some things that maybe, you know, if you've ever kind of had a feeling that your dog was trying to tell you something from now on, anytime you have that feeling, trust that your dog is trying to tell you something. And so it's just a matter of, um, kind of working your way back to figure out what it is. So I'm gonna start screen, screen sharing now. And just uh, for my lack of multitasking sake, I'm gonna walk you through everything, uh, just kind of the, a, a basic overview of what I'd like to share. And then um, we can have time for questions. And if you have any questions about your pups, then I will um, happily answer those for you. And so here, what we've got going on is, first of all, we need to tackle what I call the elephant in the room, which is what is animal communication? What the heck is it? And here, the analogy I like to, to, to make is that people are from Mars and pets are from Venus. Now, if you have ever taken any kind of public speaking class, or if you had to take business class to talk about verbal versus nonverbal communication, you probably remember your instructor saying something like 10% of communication is verbal and the other 90% is nonverbal. And then you probably remember your instructor going on to grade you almost exclusively on the verbal part. And maybe if you got any nonverbal pointers, it might have been like, you know, make more eye contact or use more appropriate arm gestures or, you know, turn your body a little bit when you speak. And that was about it. And if you're like me and you're kind of weird, you probably caught yourself thinking from time to time, I wonder what that other 90% is all about. That is what we in the animal communication field call the universal language of all species. It is a right brain language, which explains why we are not, most of us are not well versed in it. It is a sensory form of communication. There's a, there, there's a story that, so, so sorry, I am multitasking here, still trying to let people in. Um, 
One of the easiest ways to understand how this universal language of all species works out in the greater food chain of life is if you've ever watched like a National Geographic special or Discovery Channel or Nature Channel special. And it's one of those scenes that it seems like universally every single nature photographer wants to capture it. Every single nature film filmographer wants to capture it where all the different species are at the watering hole together and you know the lions and the cheetahs and the foxes and the hyenas are drinking with the the gazelles and the the flamingos and the you know so the, basically the predator and prey species are all together and i always wondered growing up and as i as i was watching those kinds of specials and i watched a lot of them and you know how do the prey species know that it's okay to go and drink yes they're wary yes they're watchful yes they're kind of watching others but each other's back but how do they know it's okay how do they know who's hungry and and who's not and the truth is is they know because they're tuning in using their gut brain using their 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 sensory brain um, scientists researchers now know that we have several we actually have i would say three brains uh, based on you know different research studies we have a gut brain and the gut microbiome we have a heart brain we, our, our heart is now there's a whole new form of research science called neurocardiology that focuses on all the neural pathways in our heart. And then we have our head brain and our head brain is made up of our left brain and our right brain. And our left brain is how we've been trained. Like that's our, our whole formal education is using our left brain, our rational, logical, analytical, black, white, or gray brain. And, and that's how we've been tested. And that's how we're we are measured at work and it's just now starting to shift, but we really are still very much, especially those of us who are of a certain age, um, like me, I'm 51 and a half right now. I was trained in, you know, the left brain, the, the traditional education and really not encouraged to pay attention to the sensory language. And so let's fast forward a little bit. Everybody's drinking at the watering hole. Everybody's, you know, feeling very hydrated and very relaxed. And then there's this moment, and this is the moment that the wildlife camera people wait all day for. And it's the moment when all of a sudden all the little elk or gazelle or pronghorns start to get nervous and they start to look around and their tails flick and their ears pop up. And, you know, the little groundhogs are like making their alarm calls. And it's because they're picking up a shift in the energy of the predator species. They're tuning in to the shifting emotions, the shifting mental pictures, the shifting landscape of we're getting close to happy hour or lunchtime or dinner hour. People are getting hungry, you know, or beings are getting hungry. Their tummies are rumbling. And so all of a sudden it's go time and the prey species start running and the predators start chasing and usually somebody ends up plated and served. And so that's a very simple example of how this functions in the wild. And it's also why we're the only species that has essentially kind of opted out of using it, which is why we're at such a disadvantage in communicating with nature and communicating with our pets and communicating with the wild animals we share space with and, and, and trying to save our planet is because we don't, trust we don't remember all of these other ways that we can send and receive messages and we're going to talk about this specific to your pets in just a minute i just want you to have kind of a big picture overview so the the language that we use is spoken words you know if we get all excited oh my goodness this dog knows 250 human words oh my goodness this dog knows 2500 human words oh my goodness this dog can press on little pads and and make sentences but Still, we're tasking, sure, they're smart, smart enough to learn their language. The question we need to be asking is, are we smart enough? Are we dedicated enough? Are we loving enough to learn theirs? And so, of course, not everybody feels called to do this work publicly like me and hang out a shingle and answer the question, oh, you do what again? But that's what I'm here for. And there's all kinds of resources that we can tune into and tap into to help really improve the quality of our animals' lives. And that starts with really giving them a voice and, and giving them a chance to share whatever they've got on their mind and in their heart. And so what we're dealing with here is 
pairing mental images with emotions and then our words. And that's what our animal, animals are looking for. And, and so the reason, the reason what I'm, what, what we're really, what are really striving for here is when we start to bring our sensory channels back online, when we start to tap back into, you know, if you've ever had just like a gut feeling about something and, and you know, maybe your partner or your colleague or your boss is like, yeah, but tell me why. And you're like, I don't know why. I just feel that this is the right decision, that this is the wrong decision. I just have a bad vibe about something. Or if you've ever looked at your dog and just thought, I feel like something's wrong, but the vet says everything is fine or I feel like my dog's not happy, or there's all kinds of places we can go with this, but it starts with this, it's a gut sensation and it's part of your fight or flight survival system. And it's actually already, it's, it's, it's a birthright language. So it's like, it's not that only I can do it. And I used to think that I, you know, I used to hire animal communicators. I used to think, oh, those are the special people that can do this. And I wish I had gotten that gift, like it's, you know, music or playing soccer or something. No, this is something we've all got it in our operating system. It's just most of us, we've got so many other bells and whistles and gizmos that we're looking at that we had, we don't realize that it's there. Nobody ever told us to go look for it and, 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 and download, unzip the file and download the software and start working with it. And so what we're doing here is we're continuing to try to test our way into learning what's going on with our animals, you know, and, and often we feel so limited by what, let's say, for instance, Western veterinary medicine has to offer. And it's not that it's not fabulous, but it has a place, a very specific place. There's all kinds of other places we can go to get information. And so kind of our goal is as we start to open up our intuitive pathways again, we can send and receive messages um, in ways that feel more natural to our animals and what they're already trying to do with us we begin to open up our world. We be, I, I share the story, the very first time I ever formally communicated with an animal was an iguana, actually. Of course, I thought it was gonna be a dog or a cat and it turned out I saw yellow skin and I was like, nope, that's not a dog or a cat. And I just remember feeling like I've never felt so alive and so connected before in my life because the truth is, is we are often, hom we homo sapiens, <laughs> are often portrayed as an invasive species. Like we are killing the planet. We are robbing all the rest of the species of their rightful places to live. We are, you know, if we weren't here, the, the earth would be so happy. And the truth is, is that we're not an invasive species. We just act like it. We do belong here. And the more you start to open up these intuitive pathways, the more you're gonna start to feel that way. And you're gonna start to very organically feel the flow of your life and be able to feel your way into what is best for my dog? What is best for my partner? What is best for my child? What is best for the planet? And in order to do that, we have to start tuning back into how, what are these other channels? And there's lots and lots of channels, but these are the six major channels. And I also have a free six day animal communication camp. If you want to dive into this a little bit deeper, you can head over to animal love languages. I think the website is pretty obvious on every page. Um, but I do have a, uh, I have a free, it's under free tools. Uh, it's under learn with me and it's 10, 15 minutes a day. You can learn more about it. But for our purposes today, our tools are seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, Sensing, which is a kinetic or a, um, a, a skin, it's our, about skin touch. It's also about emotions, sensing emotions, and then knowing. And the knowing is the deep gut hunch, as I was talking about. Like if you've ever had your phone ring and you just knew who it was that was on the phone before you went and picked it up. That's an example of knowing. Now, what is an example of seeing? An example of seeing might be something as simple as when you are wondering about something or you ask your your dog hey what would you like for lunch you just see uh, an image of let's say a hot dog um or what that was that was i'm sorry that was a terrible analogy <laughs> it's really bad okay reset let's say you see an example of a tasty steak or 
maybe you see what they normally eat. Who knows? But let's say um, if I asked if I asked Flash Gordon, what do you want to do today? Maybe I might see an image of him cooling his heels in that fun rock pond at Rice University. So it might trigger an internal memory. Um, and I'm suddenly kind of seeing a little movie clip in my head. Smelling, now that that's, this is a really, smelling and tasting are really interesting ones when you're working in interspecies conversations. I can, I, I will never forget the first time I smelled dirty socks, specifically my friend's dirty socks, because his cat was about to go to kitty boarding hotel while he went on vacation and we were talking to his cat about what would make him feel more comfortable and the cat's response was I want to smell my human and so what he sent me was the scent of my friend's dirty socks and and along with a little image of some socks and him cuddled up in it which was really cute and really stinky um Tasting is another really interesting one <laughs> when, I mean, you may not think that half a lizard is delicious, but you're, you're, you're okay. Your dachshund might think that's the best thing going. So hearing is another one, you know, and again, our animals will try to convey messages to us and we might get a little sound clip. We might get, um, we're going to talk next about noise events and how we can use these intuitive pathways to help our dogs through noisy holidays, like 4th of July coming up. And so we might hear a loud sound. We might ask our dog, you know, what makes you really nervous? And you might get a sound like a, like thunder. And you might, or you might go back to a memory and you, you literally are hearing the sound effects. Um, sensing can be, as I mentioned, it can be physical. Um, I often, because I tend towards the medical intuitive side with my own animal communication practice, I often get a lot of physical sensations, which is really fun, especially when the, my pet client is suffering from gastric distress or migraines or something like that, but also emotions. Uh oh, but also, um, also anybody who is not muted, if we could go ahead, let me see if I can help with this and take care of that. I think we've got everyone now. And so something, so something like that. Now, how do I get, okay, let me see if this will work. Um, okay. Get that off the screen. Okay. Sensing can also be emotions. Let's say if you've noticed that your dog is not their usual self and you tune in and you ask what, you know, what's going on. And right after my father passed last year, our doctor spent a lot of time in what was my dad's room before I moved in here. And he would just go there and I would tune in to ask him what's going on. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm, he would show me a picture of my dad and I would just get this sense of, of, he was just hang, they were hanging out together and he was kind of decompressing and some grief, some sadness, just, he was just grieving and we might get these, these, these inner sensing. And then the knowing, of course, we've talked about. So I want to share with you today, this, this is the number one thing you've got, we've got, we've had a little overview now of, you know, what is animal communication? It's an intuitive sensory language that functions through your right brain. Let's see what's going on in the chat. Oh, not even to worry about. Okay. Somebody said, sorry, I was listening while picking groceries. Not to worry at all. I totally get it. HEB is a madhouse, especially on the weekends. So animal communication is a, um, a sensory language, it is, it filters through our right brains, which is how we can get the, the, these intuitive, um, these, these, these sensory pathways are so important because our right brain is our creative brain. It's, it, it's, our, it's the brain that imagines into being. Every great idea that we've ever had, including hanging out with dogs and sharing our life with dogs came in through our right brain. Uh-huh, yeah, including parrot nap time, right? came in through our right brain. And so we need to be aware of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, sensing, and, um, and knowing, because we need to understand how these other communication pathways can serve us and can help us con to connect with our pets. And we understand everybody can do it. This is part of our operating system. Not, not everybody knows this, but okay, let me put you up here. Come here, sweet baby. Sorry about this. He is, do you want to go in your casa? Excuse me just a minute. Go in your casa. Okay. Precious angel. Um, 
we have four different species, well, five, if you include the humans, we have five different species in this household. So always lots going on, but what most, what I'd say probably what even most beginning animal communication students don't realize, and I know this, I, I'm saying this authentically because I was one of them. What I did not realize, let's say, here's an easy, easy example. Um, let's say, and there, this, is, this is something that I've worked on with our dachshund a lot. Um, Flash Gordon is extremely um, um, food centric. <laughs> His love language is edible. We, we joke about that all the time. And he is best friends with our tortoise, Malti, who's also got the um, edible love language. And so the two of, the two of them really kind of have bonded over food, but that, that was an aside. But Flash tends to kind of really get up in our face while we're eating, and he can also get a little food aggressive. So we've been working with him to sit on the red carpet while we are eating. And this backfired at first because I did not realize that Flash was, was he wasn't listening to my words. I was just starting to learn animal communication and I wasn't very fluent in the language yet. And I did not realize that for our pets, again, pet, you know, people are from Mars, pets are from Venus, pets, all, all non-human animals tune in first to our emotions, next to our mental, mental pictures. And if necessary, they'll listen to our words and try to figure out which human words we're using that they know and what they mean. We default to the level of words all the time. And we don't, we rarely pay too much attention to what's going on in terms of our mental pictures and the emotions that we're pairing with them. So where I was going wrong with Flash, he, it's not that he didn't understand what I wanted him to do in terms of my words. It's that my emotions and my mental pictures weren't matching up with my words. Now, what do I mean when I say, if those of you who are, who are actually are able to watch the video and you're, you're seeing this little screen share that says change your UTV channel, what is UTV? UTV is your pet's favorite channel. UTV is the channel that your dachshund watches. And if you have any other species in the house, they do too. They watch it all day long. You're, you're not only the apex predator in the house and the, 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 the pack leader, if you will, or the, um, the alpha, if you, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of the controller of all the goodies. So in some ways that means you're at the, the top of the food chain. Of course, we all know in other ways, it means we're at the bottom uh, because our pets are always trying to figure out ways to, um, to communicate what they want and get it. And so if we're not really, really clear and really congruent in how we communicate the boundaries and the household order and the safety rules, et cetera, et cetera. Our animals are really going to have a lot of wiggle room to not, um, not comply with what we feel is the right, uh, the right direction to go or the right behavior to have, let's say during mealtime. So going back to the example of Flash Gordon and the red carpet, I was telling Flash, I want you to sit on the right red carpet while we eat our dinner. And I would even lead him over there and I would put his little buddy furry butt down on the red carpet. And I would say, okay, sit, stay good, you know, good, sit, good, stay. And then five seconds later, he would get back up and come over. And it took me a while to realize that he wasn't listening to my words. He was watching UTV. He was watching my mental pictures and he was tuning into my emotional state. And what was happening was every single time I would get ready to eat my meal, I would start dreading what was to come, which was him getting up in my face and whining and putting his head between my legs and acting like he hadn't had a meal in a month. And, you know, I have like a lot of food issues. So I would get, I'd feel really guilty and I couldn't enjoy my dinner. And it was like, you know, I just need you to stay put while I'm eating. But he wasn't seeing that. What he was seeing, I was actually imagining all of the times that he hadn't sat on the red carpet. All I was actually Re going back in my in my left brain memory archives and I was replaying all the times that he'd done all the things I didn't want him to do. And my emotion was super frustration. Like I was so, I was like, oh God, here it comes again. I'm going to have to do the red carpet thing and he's not going to get it just like he didn't get it yesterday and last week and last month. And so, because Flash is paying attention first to my emotions and to my mental pictures, what he was getting from me 
was an image of him getting up from the red carpet paired with lots and lots of frustration from me. And the, the, the message that he got from that was, mom, uh, or really I'm his auntie, um, we're co-parent, me and my mom now, live, now that we live together, we're co-parenting, but, or co, co-keeping or co-caring. Um, he was like, ah, oh, Andy Shannon is really upset. And if I get up from the red carpet and I come over to her, she'll probably feel a lot better. So he was absolutely the opposite of what I wanted him to do because I was not tending to my own broadcast. It's no different than when we're at the watering hole. If we're not tuned in to that subtle shift when the, all of a sudden one of the lionesses belly rumbles and she starts imagining juicy elk and we're an elk, if we're not tuned into that, we're going we're gonna to be plated and served. And so even though it's subtle, it's important to understand this. And the reason I wanted to talk about it today is number one, your pets are always watching UTV 24 seven. You are their favorite channel. They watch you all the time. They're constantly tuned. It's why off, it's why we love, we love dogs. We love cats. We love birds so much because they, they seem to know that, you know, have you ever noticed sometimes your, your dog seems to know how you're feeling or what you're thinking before you do. And especially if you're upset and they just, it's like the empathy factor is really high. But so is there's a self-serving factor too. And that's what, and because, and, and, it's interesting, and this is an aside, but apparently uh, research have, researchers have learned that some time ago, thousands of years ago, or maybe it was hundreds of years ago, I don't know, um, dogs diverged from wolves and they've got an extra set of muscles around their eyes that make, it, 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 it helps them better make that puppy eyes look that they have. And wolves don't have this. So dogs, like literally their anatomy has changed. Even their, I mean, when we think about how far they're willing to go to try to connect with us, to try to communicate with us, that they're literally having structural changes to better serve them to form these deep connections with us. So when we want to share something with them, when we want to teach them something, when we have to say no, you know, it, because I said so isn't a good enough reason, especially when we're not congruent about how we're sharing no. So, so because this can get into kind of a complex topic and I don't want it to go there, and this is a lot of information, it's kind of like a big data dump in less than an hour, but I want to talk about a very specific context for how to change your UTT. TV channel, and it relates to noise events. Now, you can use this for anything, but because we've got 4th of July coming up, and that is typically the noisiest holiday of the year, and depending where you live, I once lived in a neighborhood here in Houston where it felt like it wasn't just 4th of July the day, it was the week. <laughs> Because they set off fireworks in the morning, at noon, and at night for a solid week. And the same thing at New Year. So if you're living in that kind of an environment, you really, you really need this tool. But it's the same, same thing holds true with fireworks. And it's why, you know, all of the normal helps like CBD or melatonin or take them for a play date and tire them out or, you know, put that there's even ear ear sound can't noise canceling earphones that uh, block the sound if they're made for dogs <laughs> so there's lots of, there's there's music there's solvage tones there's essential oils there's all kinds of things and none of them seem to get right to the core what they are are band-aids because what's going on is deeper than any it's and i'm not saying don't use these things please use these things i I'm sound averse myself. I'm a highly sensitive person. And I find that a lot of dachshunds are highly sensitive. There's something about being so close to the ground. They can feel, in fact, there's two kinds of noise reactive 
animals. One is the sound reactive, and these are the ones that are going to directly respond to the loud sound. The other kind of reactive animal is a sensory reactive, and it's a vibrational reaction. And so the sound doesn't even necessarily have to be loud because they feel the vibration so strongly in their bodies. And when we've got animals that are closer to the ground, like, like, like my tortoise or like our dachshunds, because they're, they're just, they're shorter, they're smaller, they're closer to the ground. They can feel the, 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 the change in the atmosphere before a storm. They can feel, I mean, this is why scientists are now finally starting to get interested in certain species that seem to be great storm predictors. These, you know, if, if you've got a sensory reactive dog, then they're going to feel the vibration every time a firework is set off. It may not even be the noise that's that's um, triggering them. It's the vibration. That's why changes in barometric pressure can get to our animals sometimes. It's part of why thunderstorms can be so scary. It's not just the sound effects or the cool special effects with the, you know, it's cool to us. It's terrifying for them. And it's, it there's, when we get down to the core level, they're looking to us yet again for guidance. What do I do? Super scary out there. Fight or flight is going batshit crazy. And so what we want to do is, is tend to our UTV channel. Um, from the get-go, what we want to do is be broadcasting peace, love, and harmony. We want to... First of all, one mistake that we often make with our animals is we think, and a lot of parents make this with kids too. It's like, well, I just won't tell them in advance because I don't want them to worry. This really doesn't work because your pets are tuning in to UTV all day long. They're watching your mental pictures. It's why, it's why you're, you know, if you've got bath time on your mind, you'll see one behavior. If you've got Let's go for a walk on your mind. You'll see a different behavior. If you've got, oh, it's almost dinner time. I think I'll make him some mom made flesh, some beef liver last night. Let, let me tell you, there was a behavior that we noticed. It was a lot of eagerness. So very different behavior based on, you know, what's going through our mind, the emotions it's evoking, the mental pictures it's evoking. And so what we want to share with our pets, first of all, we want to share that it's coming up. We want to tell them, we want to give them the heads up. Hey, we've got a very special day today. Um, it's a day of, of celebration and we're going to have a really good time today. And we are going to feel a lot of joy and a lot of connection. And if it's hard for you to get into this, this space emotionally, then what I encourage you to do is think of anything that, that, brings a smile to your, to your face and, or makes you laugh. It could be uh, your favorite memory with your dog. It could be your, um, think about when you first met, think about how you knew your pet was the one. Um, if, you know, if you're just, if you're, if you're just still getting to know your, your dog, or if you're, I know several of you mentioned that you work with rescues, you work with fosters, um, think about anything. Think about a favorite movie clip. Think about something that makes you smile and laugh. Think about um, Susan Boyle's audition on the on Britain's Got Talent. I think about something that just lifts your, and you can feel it, just lifts your heart, just opens your, where you, you just feel like you could breathe again. Like you could, oh yeah, that was so funny. That was, I such, or think of it was just a party where you had such a good time. That's which that's the and that's the emotion that you want to be sending to your dog is good time, good day. We're gonna have a good time. We're gonna have lots of special things that we do today. And in the evening, there's gonna be a special celebration. And we're gonna to be together and it's gonna be wonderful. And again, you know, use all of the normal, anything that you see that has helped use it, but it's, we're changing, we're shifting. This is something special that we're doing. This is something for extra comfort, extra enjoyment. This is not something because, oh my God, he's going to go crazy and she's going to pee all over the floor or whatever it is. This is, and, you know, and, and this also can apply to going to the vet. This can apply to anything. But we, we're wanting to pair a very positive 
mental image with a very positive emotion. And any way you can back, if you need to back, back your way into it, you can. And so the outcome is, you know, you can still tire them out. You can still give them rescue remedy is one of our favorites. You can still put the anxiety vest on them. You can still, you know, watch a, watch a movie together. That's kind of cancels out the sound, but ultimately what your pet is doing throughout is looking to you going, should I worry? Should I worry? Should I worry? Is there something to be worried about is, you know, imagine that you are the lead elk in the elk herd at the watering hole and all the other elks your pet is one of the other elks looking to you is is she, is she giving the signal is he giving the warning sign are their ears popping up or their tails flicking or is all well can i relax can i drink can i eat can i be calm and this is the number one thing that we need to do for our animals and it's not going to cancel out the effect of the loud sound. I'm 51 and a half and I still jump when a car backfires. I, I like to listen to music only very low. I like my movies on low. I bring earplugs to the movie theaters and the concerts. I am a highly sensitive person. And maybe that's why I ended up in this work is because I really understand um, some of the, the, the reactivity that non-human animals have to our human world. Like, they're just not desensitized to it the way that most of us are. And neither am I. And I've never managed to develop that thicker skin. And so we have to, to fact that some animals are a little more resilient than others. Um, so we still want to do all the things. We still want to protect them as much as possible. But most of all, what we want them to know is all is well. Everything's okay. We are going to have a good time we are going to get, you know, we're going to, we're going to be together as a family today. We're going to have a great time. We're going to go run around. We're going to go chase things. We're going to, you know, soak up some, some vitamin D, make some great vitamin D stockpile that out in the sun. And then we're going to cuddle up together, you know, and if that means you stay home from the fireworks and you watch a movie, with your, with your pup, because that's what they need. Great. If you go to the fireworks with your family, just make sure that you're still broadcasting really, really positive. Like everything is okay. And I can't wait to see you again and just rest easy. You know, we're going to have a special treat when I get home and just keep it, keep your UTV TV channel really, um, really your dial tuned to the, this is a, this is a happy festive holiday or it, when the, when it's a thunderstorm, you know, just play with your own mental pictures instead of um, rem going back in your archives. Cause that's what our fight or flight does, right? It's, it, it can only look to the past to figure out how to handle the present. And that's, you know, if we don't have anything in our past to tell us whether that's a saber toothed tiger up ahead or just a shadow, then we're going to have to take our chances. As, and if we're wrong, we're lunch. We don't have a chance to add that to our memory bank archives. So what we need to do is go back in our memory banks and find memories of, oh gosh, the rain, like we're, we're in a drought right now. So maybe a thunderstorm is supposed to come next week. That's what the rumor is anyway. And we envision, oh, the plants are so happy and they're just drinking and everything starts to bloom again. And that's what we're broadcasting. We're broadcasting relief and harmony and happiness and delight and gratitude during this thunderstorm. And we're not allowing our mind to go to that place where it remembers how our dog was cowering under the couch and pooping in the middle of the bed or whatever they do. You know, um, we just want to, we want to make sure that we, we, we are very careful about picking the UTV channel so that our pets are only watching what we want them to watch. And it does mean becoming more mindful because how we feel, and this is where I see a lot of my human clients get really motivated. It's like, sometimes we're not all that motivated to change our channel for our own benefit, but when we see how it affects those we love, we become more motivated. So here, and here's something, here's something a little bit different now. I'm gonna just shift gears because again, we don't have a lot of time and I wanna wrap this up in about two minutes. So you have time to ask your questions, especially if you have anything specific you wanna ask about your pup. 
but I promised you that we would talk a little bit about how you could start playing with your intuitive pathways and just learning a little bit more about your animal. And there's two fun things I want to suggest that you can do. And the first one is, I call it, hello, my name is. But let's say you, um, like our dog, we can use the example of um, Flash Gordon. And I actually did this, did this last night as I was preparing to talk with you today. But last night um, I wrote down Flash's name and I just started brainstorming. Like if you hear, so, so what we're doing here is let's, you take your dog's name, whatever your dog's name is. And if you've got especially good if you want to get to know a new a new dog maybe a dog that you're fostering or a dog that you're working with at, um, through a charity um, or a dog that's new to your family and or even a dog where you're still trying to choose their name you can take the name and kind of forget for a minute that it's attached to your specific animal the specific animal you're working with so let's just take flash gordon's name and just forget for a minute everything we think we know about Flash Gordon. And you just, you could write the name down or you can just, you know, just verbally start brainstorming. What are some qualities? What are some adjectives? What are some free associations that come to mind as you brainstorm what the name Flash Gordon brings up in you? What does it mean to you? And so I brainstormed, it means Flash Gordon, it means quick. It means brave. Um, to me, the name Flash Gordon means smart. It means um, caring, uh, cares about other people's safety and well being. Flash Gordon is also uh, prudent and can be cautious. Um, Flash Gordon means to me, I see the color. So you can also, see, well, I see the color red and yellow because it's an associate. I don't actually really know too much about the the cartoon character or the, the Marvel character, um, Flash's name came to my mom in a dream, which is really cool. So we were just like, okay, I guess that's his name. So, so I see the colors red and yellow and I feel, um, I feel a lot of valor, um, that he's a, he's a great warrior, that he is, he can be tough. He can be, he can he can really be headstrong when he gets an idea into his head about what is right. So you get the idea. You take your name, take your dog's name, and you just start listing some qualities that you, you know, and, and really brainstorm it. Like pretend you're in, in a meeting or, you know, or at work or at school and you're brainstorming a new idea. Like what is this, what is this name bring up in me and pay attention to color. Do you think of a, uh, when I think of Flash Gordon, the song, We Are the Champions comes to mind for some reason, just because I think of him as a superhero and one of the good guys. And so think of the, and, and then reattach the name to your, to your dog and, and start noticing if there are new, new qualities that you, you've never noticed before about, you know, because our, the name that an animal has it is it it's it's it comes to you for a reason like why out of all the names in the world did you pick this one and it's kind of just as mysterious in a way as why how out of all the animals in the world the millions and millions of animals and the millions and millions of people how did the two of you find one another and that's where things start to get pretty magical and, and even miraculous. Now, you may also discover that maybe, um, and I, I see this actually more than I expected to see when I first got into this work. Uh, let me just make sure we've got, uh, how do I do this? Cool. Okay. Um, so, Sometimes you may even find out that um, the name doesn't really feel like a fit. And sometimes I, I more than I more than I expect, I often will will hear from from pets that say, you know, I, I want a new name. That's perfectly OK if that comes up. And that's that's a little bit off topic and it's a little bit. But so before you consider changing, especially if you've got an animal that's new to the family, maybe you're not completely settled on the name that you've picked yet. That is OK. And um, they, you know, 
animal, there's a really funny YouTube video and this guy has, he, he works with a lot of rescue dogs and he calls them all like shithead and, you know, F face and all these, but they, and, and he'll call them and they come running with so much love <laughs> and they're like so enthusiastic about seeing him. And it's because they really don't care what their name is. What they care about is they feel the love and they see his mental picture of joy. And how much he, and, and the devotion that he looks at them with. And he could call them anything because they're really, they really don't care. As long as that mental picture is love and devotion and that emotion is, is, is joy and care, they're going to come running. And so it's, if, if, if there's a name mismatch, it's what we're looking for is, is congruency within us that um, we feel like the name is a match and, and, we use it with confidence and we feel that it's, it's, um, it fits our animal. And so these are the cases where sometimes an animal will request a name change. And that, that can be really fun to work with when I'm doing an animal communication session. But the second thing you can do is just ask yourself if, if my, if my dog was human, what would their resume look like? Like what kind of a degree or what kind of education or training would they have? Would they have gone to trade school to, to work with their hands? Would they have gone, you know, for a PhD to be a molecular biologist or a, a professor? Would they be um, in computer programming or in sales? Um, you know, so, so gather kind of a resume to, to just, just, take a step back for a minute and imagine that your dog is a human being. And this is a really good way to get some intuitive information from your animals some things they want you to know about their personality, about their temperament, about their preferences, about what they bring to your family, uh, their talents and their, you know, and also their weaknesses, the things that maybe in one context make that, that looks like a strength. And in another context, looks like a total weakness. Like I look at Flash Gordon and I'm like, yeah, he loves food. Like I don't love food that much. He loves food and he totally appreciates a good meal, you know, and that's a real strength because he's enthusiastic about eating. He's not a picky eater. We, you know, have no trouble feeding him. It helps us get all the nutrients into him. He, you know, all the stuff that he, maybe a dog wouldn't normally want to eat like spirulina or, you know, flax or something like he gobbles it up. So on, it's a real strength. On the other hand, it can be a real liability. He also eats cardboard. He eats those squeaky things out of dog toys. He eats strange weeds in the yard. I mean, he eats dirt. And so and we're, trust me, we're working on all that. We've got him. He's getting Reiki treatments. I'm a Reiki master. We take him to holistic fat. We're working on this. So it's like in an other context, it can be a real weakness. And so we're just looking for that, you know? So rather than saying, okay, here's something in our, in our animal that we have to fix. It's like, let's first seek to un to empathize. I don't even want to say understand. Let's seek to, um, because we may never understand. Let's seek to empathize. Let's walk a mile in their shoes or in their paws. Um, I also have a free meditation on the animallovelanguages.com site called Meditate on Your Pet. And this is a really awesome way to do this with your dog. It helps you feel closer. It helps you to start gently because it, in these intuitive pathways, they are real. They're documented. Um, frequencies vibrations, um, you know, all of our thoughts, our emotions, our mental pictures, they, they, they change, they change the whole atmosphere around us. If you've ever had like a really bad day and you've gone stomping through the day and it seems like you get stuck at every traffic light and you're on hold for 30 minutes with the customer service and, you know, the checkers rude to you. And it's like, and then you wake up and you're in like a wonderful mood and everything's, and you just have a, you know, you flow through your day. Like we can see it. We don't have to even have the science and there is science, but we don't have to have that. My brain doesn't hold data very well. So it's like, I don't need to go and hunt down all of the data for this in order to believe that it's true. I experience it. It. As my mood shifts, my environment changes. And so it's about understanding it, it's subtle. It's like if you, you know, your, your inner ears are, will deliver sounds to you, but they will sound muted, almost like you're underwater. Your inner eyes will deliver pictures to you, but they will be softer. 
almost like you're, you need to, a new prescription in your glasses um, and your gut knowings, they'll be persistent. And, and you, you know that they're gut knowings because your brain can't talk you out of them. Your friends can't talk you out of them. Your partner can't talk you out of them. They just persist and that's how you know. And so all of this is simply designed to kind of wake up your intuition. The more you can be playful, just start very simply, you know, what, what is my dog's name, you know, evoke in me. Um, or if you didn't choose your dog's name and you wish you'd had that opportunity, what name would you choose? If, and you, another fun thing to do is ask, you know, just if my dog had chosen their own name, what name do I think they would have chosen? What name would, would my dog have chosen for himself or herself if they could have chosen? Um, what job would they do? And they would rock it and they would be amazing. You know, and another way to do it is like, what job would they totally suck at? Like that, like you would never put them in this job. And, and th these are just some fun ways to just kind of open up your intuitive pathways, get to know your, your pet a little bit better and receive some information they want you to know about themselves and start to really open that empathy channel. So that's, that ends the formal part of this presentation. Um, I know we covered a lot of ground in a really short amount of time. I would love to answer any questions that you have. If you have anything um, specific about your pup that you want to ask, I would be happy to use the, and I'm happy to stick around a little longer as well if you have questions. So um, you could just raise your hands or just unmute yourself and, and talk and um we can we can chat. Hi, so thank you for presenting. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot today. Um, so my question mm -hmm. is I have a mini long and she gets really scared whenever we go on walks. So anytime she sees another person or any other animal on the sidewalk, she automatically stops and will not move. Or anytime like I try to even pull her one direction, she automatically pulls the opposite. Do you have any recommendations for that? Can, can you, what did you say at first? You have a what? Miniature long-haired dachshund. Oh, a, a mini, I, I, for some reason I heard a May Long and I was like, oh. I don't know what a May Long is. A miniature, <laughs> and, and what is her name? Her name is Cinnamon Bun. Oh my God, that's adorable. Okay, let me ask Cinnamon Bun, what is going on? So when she, when you're walking, she stops. Yes. Anytime she and sees a person. Anytime she sees a person, is it just people or is it other dogs? In, at, at night, anytime she sees a person, dogs, anything. She just stops. Well, it's, she just, uh, it's interesting because what I'm seeing, I'm sending her a mental picture of what you just described so that I'm sure that she understands the question I'm asking. And I'm not getting back an anxiety response at all. I'm getting back curiosity and a desire to interact. And she would like this, she would like to meet this other person, these other people, and she would like them to come and greet her. Have okay. you ever noticed, have you ever noticed, um, She's pulling, she's pulling my, my memory back to uh, my mom's soul dog, which was her last dog, JP Morgan. And he literally, he would do the exact same thing. He would stop and he would not go until the person would come over and pat him or praise him or do something. Have you ever noticed that with cinnamon bun? Yes. She loves it when people greet her yep. after that, she'll walk and yep. then she'll be fine. Yep. That's what it is. That's okay. what it is. She just, she wants, she, this is, this is the highlight of her walk is she loves to be, and I'm just getting the sense that she's really, really proud of her appearance. And she thinks she, she's really pretty and really beautiful. And she loves being admired. And she, she feels is. like she, she feels like when she goes out on a walk, it's like, she's an ambassador to the neighborhood. She's bringing her beauty. She's bringing her, um, her, she's like, she's out and everybody is kind of like, Oh, she's out. Let's go mm -hmm. get our hit of joy and beauty and cuteness. And so that's what it is. Okay. I can yeah. definitely see that in her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I love this, Sarah. Not a question, but Maggie would be a CEO. She's bossy. That's awesome. 
how to help <laughs> docs and anxiety. Okay, Amy, um, are you still with us? No, Amy is not still with us. Um, but, you know, it really, Amy, it depends on the context for the anxiety, but so I'd, I'd actually have to probably get a little more info. I'm sorry, you can, you can direct message me if you want and give me a little more information if you watch the recording of this. Does anybody else have a question? So, hi, this is Gail. I hi, have, Gail. I have three miniature wire hair dachshunds, and two of them mind beautifully. The older one is seven, and he is very stubborn. He'll go outside in the backyard, and I'll tell him to come. His name is Spencer. That's and okay. he totally ignores me. And I mean, he just, it's, it's like, he's just going to do whatever he wants. And when he's ready, he'll come. Okay. I'm going to ask you, and you may not know the answer to this question, but does Spencer have any trouble peeing or pooping? No. No. Okay. Because what, as you're sharing this with me, I'm getting, I'm getting an image of Spencer and my attention is drawn down to that area of my body and I'm getting a sense of sluggishness. It's hmm. like, it's, he, it's not coming and again, I am not a veterinarian. I am not, I am a trained medical intuitive, but I am not a veterinarian. I'm not a med medical professional, but I'm, and I'm, and I'm not getting that that's necessarily the full picture of it, but I'm getting that he just, he needs to take his time and, and the, and it, it may just be something the next time you go um, to have a vet check that you just have that checked out. Um, but I'm also getting that he's not quick the way your other two are. And he, he's bringing an image to mind of my father and my father, I, I, he was loving my, I love him. I love him. <laughs> but my dad was not, my mother's very quick, quick, quick. Those of you who met her quick, quick, quick. My mom, my dad, exactly the opposite. And he just, he just takes his time. He doesn't, he didn't walk fast. He didn't, he, he just, he didn't even make decisions quickly. And I'm getting that Spencer, there's an element of that too, that Spencer gets outside and it's almost like he needs some time alone and away from the other two and just some time to himself. Does that make sense to you? Um, well, he definitely is the boss of those two. He, he, he's, he's the alpha, mm -hmm. and and he, it's it's almost like he thinks he's the alpha of me too, and he's gonna come when he's good and ready. He's yeah. Just, well, it. He's just dicking around. That's what I call it with dachshunds. You know, he's just. It, it can be that, but there's also, there's really, there's an element of, it's almost like slow motion with him. And he, it doesn't, it really doesn't feel to me like he's just being willful for the sake of being willful. It really feels like there's something in his personality that just needs to decompress. And he does it really well when he's out in nature. I, again, I don't know if me, my energy, and I'd have to do a longer session with him and really get into this with him, but my energy being drawn down to my, down to my um, urogenitary area um, and the, uh, the sluggishness, I feel it has to do with him grounding and his root chakra and just ground. And I know some of this can sound really woo, but I have no problem with woo because um, I have seen it work time and time again, when we start to kind of delve into these issues and there's something to be said for regrounding to the earth and just having some time and some space and his personality to me feels like sometimes he just needs to just be out there on his own. Okay. You know, and to just maybe just kind of 
give him maybe just pad your schedule a little bit. I know it can be hard when, you know, we've got such busy lives and we're like, dude, I I need, I got to go, you know, like you need to potty and get back in the house. And he's like, no, I need to be out here. I need to reground on the earth. I need to take my time peeing and pooping and, you know, be in my man cave for a while. And that's really the vibe I'm getting from him. Okay. Okay. I Thank hope that you. helps. Yeah, of course. So, uh, Sarah, I see. Um, oh, and Mars, that's so exciting. Congratulations that you got, you just got your puppy today. That's amazing. I hope we'll get to see pictures. You may have already posted them in the group. Um, Sarah, you're saying Maggie shakes when the washer makes noise. That doesn't surprise me at all. She's, she's probably a vibrational, um, she's a sensory she react reactionary and sensory she stresses very yeah. very sensitive <laughs> yeah she's highly well and you know with highly sensitive pets half the battle is just getting it you know and, and just being able to okay you're highly sensitive i know i mean sometimes it's just about saying i know i i hate thunderstorms too <laughs> they're totally yeah. you know that's totally scary yeah it's going to be over I'm soon I'm super sensitive human too. So I don't know if she picks up. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So the two of you are highly sensitive and you, and, and what, what you do is number one, you acknowledge it and you're like, yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. That's it. It is. It's really scary and affirm that. And like, so she doesn't feel like she's alone dealing with this and be like, yeah, this really sucks. Doesn't it? You know, but it's more like, it's the spirit of things like, yeah, this really sucks. Doesn't it? You know, but thank goodness we're together. <laughs> And let's yeah. hear, I know, like, I get it too. And like, let's go and do this thing that we do. Let's get up on the couch because it, it gives us some insulation from yes. the noise and let's cuddle. And there's also, you know, you can, um, have you ever tried anything like rescue remedy? What, well, which would be like. Rescue Remedy is a Bach flower essence and there's one for pets that they make with no alcohol. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at, okay. yeah, yeah. You can well, put, a little, put a little drop in her water, a few drops in her water. Um, we've literally tried, she's got a um, prescription now and I hate giving it to her because it just makes her limp, um, but it, it keeps her calm and less stress. But then um, we've literally tried you know, CBD, we've done the, the thunder vest. We've, I resorted to, um, like just regular t-shirts and blankets, just wrapping her in a blanket. And it's just like, I think it now when I sense that it's going to rain or like, no, it's going to rain. I had this like anxiety, like, oh, great. You know, she's going to be yeah, see, that's what, we're, that's what we were talking about today. That's yeah. what we're talking about today. And so there's a couple of things that are coming up. One, I'm seeing hands pressing, and I'm wondering if you've tried acupressure points for anxiety. No, but I'd be because there's a yeah. Well, there's a kinetic element to releasing anxiety, and you yeah. can see it in a wild setting. You know, if if let's say a a bird gets captured by a hawk and they manage to get free, you'll see that animal literally stand up and shake their bodies from head to tail yeah. and shake yes. it off and they've got to let it go right then and move on they can't get stuck in the past or they're going to end up you know right. caught again so well, she does shake there's a, a lot there's, when, there's when a happens. kinetic yes. element yeah there, there's there's very much a kinetic element to it and the acupressure points might help but the other thing that i'm going to suggest is um and you can actually find this if you go to animal love languages backslash podcast look for a woman named ferris J. I i interviewed her she does eft emotional freedom technique tapping for pets and i would suggest okay. that you do this together because you're going to need to release your anxiety right. for your own noise sensitivity you're going to need to release your anxiety over her but you can also do it by proxy for her yeah even though okay. i am so anxious <laughs> and so scared of fire even though and you fill in the blank and then i i acknowledge that i'm the pure and perfect pet now it's time for me to go on with my life i'm ready to be healthy i'm ready to be happy i really want to live do that three times and you can proxy tap here or on your chest 
okay. or if she'll tolerate it, tap down her spine because that's where all of her nerve pathways are. Okay. And you can help her to release that. But I would also look into, you can either do proxy pressure points. You, I, I'm not exactly sure which ones are the ones for anxiety, but I think they're, they're um, above the somewhere in the back legs. I, I can't, I'm not a, I'm not a, an acupressurist, but that yeah. would be something else. But the biggest thing is going to be you changing that UTV channel for her. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Well, yeah. that'll be something yeah. to try, I guess, this week. <laughs> Absolutely. And let me know how it goes. Um, I will. Thank you definitely. so much. Of course. Always happy. Uh, happy to help in any way that I can. Okay, um, I have a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... We have seven dogs. Um, Congratulations. <laughs> we just got two new babies. Oh, hi there. Oh. Oh. And um, Jax thinks that I'm his human and he does not like sharing. But when I'm not mm -hmm. home, he's okay with everybody. And he plays with everybody. And everybody's happy. But when I get home, nobody wants to listen to dad. Nobody wants to go outside with dad. Um, so if they need to go potty they'll wait for me to get up to take them potty they won't listen if i'm home i'm just wondering how we can get them to all go outside when i'm home and not have to get up every time because <laughs> nobody wants to listen to him so you're talking about when you say dad are you talking about your human partner <laughs> yes so my I'm human partner wanting, i yes. just want to be sure my human partner <laughs> okay so jake is jake is is the Jackson. jack yes so Jackson and Gemma are our middle dogs and children. Um, we but have who's the one that you said thinks Jax? The, Jax. Okay. So Jax will play with the babies and so much fun with them when I'm not home. But when I'm home, it's like, you're my mom. Don't play with the babies. Like he's very jealous, but he's, he's not mean to them. Like they can, they can jump all over. He just doesn't want to be around them. And so what, I, what I'm, what I'm interested in is how, you're making you're you're not making but it's like it feels like your into your intuition is telling me there's a there's a connection between how Jax perceives you or the bond that the two of you have because it's normal we have we love in different ways we have I mean the bond that my mother had with JP Morgan is not the same that she has with Flash Gordon this is normal it is perfectly okay we love humans in different ways too um but what I find int intriguing is that there's, there feels like there's an intuitive connection between the bond that you and Jax have and how the whole pack, if you will, relates to your human partner, dad. Um, let me talk to Jax for just a second. Sorry, you're all sitting here staring at me having me, a woman with her eyes closed on Zoom. This is awesome. Um, what it feels like is that Jax is waiting for your permission. It's like he is, it almost, it feels like you, you're kind of the setup for the whole thing because this is a mark of the special bond that you have. And if Okay. So when when you're not going to be there or when you are wanting to take a nap or whatever, what what you what what I'm getting that you need to do is you need to tell Jax, okay, you're in charge now, and when everyone needs to go out, you go, you go to Dad, and you tell him, you, you know, like you're in charge of Dad too, so you go to him and you tell him, 
like Jax is your second in charge and dad is underneath Jax because Jax, everybody else in your interspecies family is looking to Jax for the cue, but Jax is looking to you. And he's, he right now thinks that part of his job is, is, and part of the mark of the special bond that you guys have together is you do everything for him. And so nobody gets anything if Jax isn't in charge of it. And so what you, you tell Jax, okay, I'm going to go rest. I'm going to go take a nap. You're in charge now. And your job is to go get dad when you need to go out or anybody needs to go out. You, you take away, anybody needs anything, you go to dad. Cause I'm putting you in charge while I'm resting. Does that make sense to you? Yes. Yeah. And you sent him a mental picture of him going to dad going send you know and then he'll send he'll send it sometimes this happens and you know especially when we've got a lot of movement in the family and you're adding to the your family and everybody's kind of trying because we it doesn't I don't like the idea of the concept of the pack mentality but there is something to be said for everyone finding their space and their place in a unit and we're all wired that way human animals are too and so what's going on right now is Jax is the, the stability in this this changing unit that's just expanded again. And so he needs to understand his role. So you send him a mental, mental picture and you show him when anybody needs anything in the group, I'm, I'm out, you're in charge, you go get dad and you, you know, or if dad comes to let you out, you are, I deputize you, you go out with him, you're in charge of everyone. So he feels because right now he thinks, okay, my job is to come to, to mom when I need anything. And my job is to run everything for mom. And I want everybody to understand mom and I have a special bond. But it's like, we have such a special bond, Jax, that I deputize you when, and because sometimes this happens when there's one animal that becomes kind of the spokesperson for the whole group. Especially when there's some animals that are still finding their space. They don't even know what they want or need yet. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So give that a try and, and definitely let me know how it goes. Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, everyone. Thank you for sticking around for an extra 15 minutes here. Really appreciate it. I have so enjoyed chatting with all of you and learning a little bit more about your families. And um, thank you for giving me a little bit of your Saturday and sharing a little bit more about the passion I have for interspecies communication as well. And you know how to reach me if you have any questions. Um, and I look forward to, hopefully, maybe we'll be able to do this again later this summer. Thank you. You're so very welcome. Okay, bye for now. Enjoy Thank the rest you. of your weekend. Okay, bye. Yeah.